The usual story when it comes to child monarchs is that their regent and or advisors impose their own rule over the realm, manipulate the monarch, exploit the regency for personal gain, and attempt to keep the monarch away from power for as long as possible. What happens with King Matthias I Hunyadi is highly unusual, because within weeks of his enthronement, Matthias sacks Palatine Garay and follows that up by ousting the regent, his own uncle, Michael Silagi. Garay was replaced with Matthias' supporter, Palatine Michael Orsag, one of the former seven captains of the realm of 1445, who served with Matthias' father. Soon after ousting Palatine Garay, Matthias told his uncle, the regent, to resign. He would be given the perpetual Ispanet of Bistrice, the former hereditary title of Janos Hunyadi, and a few other estates for his services. After initially resisting, Silagi was soon enough convinced to accept the resignation. Within his first year on the throne, Matthias had rid himself of the regency that put him on the throne in the first place. The king proceeded to have the royal council raise an arguably illegal extraordinary tax, without first consulting the Diet, in order to raise a mercenary force to fight the Bohemian Hussite raiders in the north, the Ottomans in the south, and Friedrich III to the west. The king's new mercenary force grew as the years progressed and became the so-called Black Army. The Black Army was Matthias' strong arm of internal rule and his main force for external conflict. And it was very expensive. The king's power grab was followed by Gara and Silagi conspiring to overthrow Matthias in 1459. The ousted Palatine summoned a so-called Diet made up of other dissatisfied parties, among whom were our old friends Nicolas of Iluk, and Jan Yishkera, who up until now was a supporter of the claim of the Polish king Casimir IV. This so-called Diet declared Frederick III von Habsburg as the rightful heir to the realm of St. Stephen and began a revolt against Matthias. But the revolt stopped very soon because Garay suddenly died. Silagi surrendered and reconciled with Matthias, only to die a year later, captured and killed by the Ottomans. The other participants were punished with minor land confiscations and granted pardons. Except for Yishkra, who continued to fight in the name of Frederick III, who was now supporting Yishkra against Matthias, while at the same time Matthias was supporting Frederick's brother Albert against Frederick, while both of them fought each other. Aside from Yishkra causing problems, Matthias was now secured in his power and enjoying support from every estate. Matthias placated the magnate families with appointments to the majority of positions on the royal council, along with other councillors that favoured his policies of reform and centralization, like the new chancellor, Bishop Ivan Vites, and Palatine Orsag. Over time, new blood was injected into the council, like the Zapolya brothers, Emmerich and Stephen, the up-and-coming Batori family, and even a few ennobled commoners. The clergy supported Matthias partially because of his efforts to restore property that was illegally seized by the nobility during the decades of chaos preceding his rule. Another part of the clergy's support was the privilege granted to the monarch of the realm of St. Stephen at the Council of Constance to nominate to effectively appoint clerical office holders. Matthias began appointing loyal young clerics to lifelong appointments, even though in some cases they did not necessarily meet the qualifications. At the start of his reign, Matthias also enjoyed the support of Pope Pius II, who ascended to the chair of St. Peter the same year Matthias did to his throne. Pope Pius was also good friends with Matthias' chancellor, Bishop Ivan Vites. They became good friends during the anti-Ottoman diplomatic efforts in the early 1450s, when the then Bishop Piccolomini was working for Frederick III. 
The royal cities and urban areas supported the king as a matter of course. It was their nature to do so, as the crown was the only guarantor of their liberties against the pretensions of the nobility and, in some cases, the church. But Matthias won the royal cities over by handling their affairs separately without the interference of the other estates. You see, at the Diet, the around 30 royal cities, with usually around 60 representatives, didn't have much influence. There were hundreds of self-representing magnates, a hundred or two representatives of noble municipalities and representatives of church institutions, and hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands, of self-representing minor nobles. Matthias, of course, enjoyed the support of the minor nobility. He was their elected native king of their own creation, the son of a hero of the realm who will keep them safe from the Ottomans and protect their ancient rights, liberties, and privileges. So, of course, at the Diet, they retroactively approved his extraordinary tax, especially after Matthias promised never to do it again. The support that Matthias enjoyed allowed him to begin implementing reforms. The judicial reforms, specifically, are an important part of Matthias's legacy. The old system of several high appeals courts was centralized into one royal supreme court under justices appointed by the king, while the system of lower courts was reformed. The courts were presided over by appointed magnate judges, but staffed by salaried, educated minor nobles and commoners. The reforms struck at the judicial power of the magnates and local power holders, who could no longer run the judiciary as they saw fit. They were now directed by the king's new educated professionals. This meant that the lower nobility and common folk suffered fewer abuses in the judicial system. Matthias also took a personal interest in some cases, particularly cases of corruption. All of this raised Matthias's popularity among the minor nobility and commoners, and he gained a reputation as a just king. To implement these reforms, Matthias needed to outmaneuver the royal council, which was full of magnates and which controlled the Grand Chancellery. It was the main administrative body of the realm that handled almost all of the documents of state. There, the royal council could interfere and stall the king's reforms. Matthias outmaneuvered them by repurposing and expanding the secret chancellery, which was used for diplomatic and minor administrative purposes of the crown. But through the chancellor, it was under direct control of the crown. The secret chancellery began to mirror and usurp the work of the grand chancellery giving Matthias control over the administration. A new educated, salaried, and loyal staff of minor nobles and commoners was also being hired. The approval and implementation of reforms was also greased by the old traditional methods of bribery, royal grants, favors, threats, pardons, etc. Of course, the entire effort surrounding the reforms cost a lot of money. While Matthias was dealing with Garay, Silagi, beginning the reforms, Frederick III, rampaging Bohemian mercenaries, not to mention his heretic father-in-law presumptive, Ottoman forces were raiding across the border. In 1459, Sultan Mehmed II erased the Serbian despotate from the map of Europe. In 1460, Pope Pius II called for another European crusade against the Ottomans. There was little to no response. In 